I'm delighted to welcome Patrick Hillsman. He's a columnist and an expert on the distribution of humanitarian aid in Gaza. Patrick, welcome to TVP World and thank you for taking the time. Thanks so much for having me. So what then is the delay in getting the, 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 the trucks of aid into Gaza, Patrick? Well, part of the problem is the fact that it's not safe for some of them to actually distribute aid because we've seen attacks against humanitarian uh, aid crossings. The United Nations, as your uh, as your journalist said earlier, says that only about half of the trucks that are supposed to have been let through are actually going to be able to gain access. And on top of it, a lot of the UN facilities that would have been aid distribution points in Gaza have been targeted, bombed. And as far as we know, hundreds of UN uh, Relief Works Agency employees have been killed in, in attacks across Gaza. So the only way really to effectively deliver aid would be to stop the targeting of vehicles in Gaza and to stop the targeting of civilians in Gaza. And as it stands right now, it's hardly surprising that it's almost impossible to distribute aid because look at what happened to even international volunteers like Damien Sobol were targeted by the IDF. If international volunteers are being targeted, imagine how bad it is for Palestinian volunteers who are trying to deliver medical aid. On top of that, we've seen systematic targeting of hospitals. And most recently, in the past few days, hundreds of bodies have been discovered at the location of the Nasser Hospital in Khan Yunus and the location of the Al-Shifa Hospital in Gaza City. This is evidence of a terrible war crime, cl clearly evidence that medical facilities are being treated as targets. And so truly the only way to actually distribute aid in Gaza right now is to cease the bombing. So now what about once the aid is able to cross and get into Gaza, what are some challenges or some issues that these workers face when they want to distribute this much needed aid? Well, the main challenge obviously would be the fact that a lot of humanitarian aid distributions have been targeted directly by the IDF. People have been shot. Um, and on top of that, a major issue is the fact that people are literally starving right now in Gaza. The UN has reported that children have died of famine. And when you move into an area where people are dying of starvation with a large amount of food, it can sometimes create a frenzy. It can create dangerous situations. And security would be needed to guard these trucks. Uh, international volunteers would be needed to create a safe process for distribution. And so far we've seen 34,000 at least civilians killed. And now the Wall Street Journal reports that Gazan authorities have essentially stopped counting because it's not safe enough to count. So the major challenge to distribution is, is the siege and the starvation and the bombing. Right, I, I, help me to understand something, please, Patrick. Um, mm. if, if the IDF is allowing trucks into Gaza, what benefit is it for them then to attack the trucks that they've already allowed in and assume, I presume, that they've been checked for weapons and bombs and so on. Mm. Um, why would they then attack the trucks? It doesn't make sense to me. It, to me, it doesn't make sense on a moral perspective, but it makes sense when you're analyzing the actions of a military that's committing actions that are bordering on genocide or actually are genocide. In, in, in Syria, we saw similar things. There were many cases when aid trucks that were approved, even by the Syrian government, ended up being bombed by the Syrian government. Go uh, governments that want to, to crush a civilian population often target aid, regardless. The only reason they've even allowed any aid in is because of serious pressure from the international community. And we've seen that they're, they're, they're going to keep targeting Gaza wholesale. That includes infrastructure, civilians, schools, uh, United Nations Relief Works Agency facilities, and of course, it includes aid trucks. Now, what about, we've mentioned aid trucks, and partially you have answered this question, but I wanted to ask, because there was a three-ship flotilla that was planning to reach Gaza after it would have uh, sailed from Turkey, but those ships were prevented from sailing by Guinea-Bissau authorities. Now, why? I mean, there was 5,000 tons of aid. Why would you stop that? Presumably, it's under pressure from, from Israel. A, a lot of these countries that have, that have smaller economies uh, really can't afford to enter into international controversies. It's similar that a lot of African states may have may very strongly want to oppose Russia, in fact, but they can't really take a position on it because they have, uh, they have a lot of trade with Russia. So I wouldn't be surprised if a country that, ha that is uh, m more wealthy than some of these countries would be able to exert influence on them to try and prevent aid from arriving.
And again, the reasons to block the flotilla is the same reason that we've seen the targeting of medical facilities, humanitarian workers, aid trucks, all of it. Right. Um, moving on from that a little bit, uh, Patrick, um, Israel has proposed a ceasefire in exchange for hostages. Um, Hamas doesn't look particularly excited about this proposal. What's your view? Well, I think some of the hang-ups that are going to happen is that there's been such a serious war going on. There have been so many deaths that I don't think that any kind of, even beyond Hamas, any kind of ceasefire that doesn't include guarantees for the civilian population, that doesn't include a guarantee that there will be essentially an air exclusion zone that doesn't allow the bombing of Gaza, a guarantee that Israeli troops will pull out, and a guarantee that international observers will be allowed in. I don't think that the Palestinian population at large would accept that, because at this point, as awful and evil as it is, the only bargaining chip that they have are those hostages. And they're bargaining a hundred or so innocent people against the millions of innocent people in Gaza. And the Israelis are perfectly willing to engage in that kind of collective punishment and essentially treating the Gazan population as another hostage exchange. So now we see now that Anthony Blinken, uh, the U.S. Um, the U.S. Uh, foreign uh, secretary, he's in Riyadh, and he has said that of course it's good that aid is coming in, but much more is needed. He also said that a ceasefire would be most effective to address the humanitarian suffering. Uh, when and under what circumstances do you think we might see such a ceasefire? Well, we've had uh, resolutions for the United Nations that the United States abstained from calling for a ceasefire already. But interestingly enough, the United States has tried to make the argument that that's a non-binding ceasefire, which is, is an unusual precedent and a lot of scholars have said is not true. But really, the only way to, to pressure a ceasefire is for countries that are supporting Israel with weapons that are being used to kill civilians, to target humanitarian aid workers, which have been used to kill U.S. citizens, Polish citizens, U.K. citizens, Canadian citizens, and tens of thousands of Gazans, 70% of whom are women and children. The only way to stop that is to cease those weapons sales and to be clear to the Israelis that we are no longer your allies when it comes to this. Right. Well, thank you for laying that out for us, Patrick. Unfortunately, we're going to have to stop there, but do come and see us again soon. Absolutely. Great to see you guys. Thank you.